Hi, everyone, and welcome to our first real week in Late 520. So what we're going to cover this week is sort of an intro to Python, but also an intro to just thinking about data cleanup for raw text. So often people forget how time consuming this task can be, and I would argue that it is more difficult and more investive than the actual analyses one will do when processing language. And so we're gonna go from having data in formats that maybe isn't great to data in formats that's better. So we're gonna talk about how to process and clean raw text. Okay. And so this lecture is four parts um, to help break this down into videos that aren't too long. And so I'm also gonna talk a little bit along the way about how to Python because most of the students who come into this course have a good working knowledge of R. And so we're actually gonna do both R and Python together throughout the semester. At the end of the semester, this will turn more into Python. So the first thing we have to think about is that language is just a bunch of, of strings. And so it's easy to then break down these strings and work with them. Okay? So language data can be considered individual characters or entire blocks of text, but either way, from a computer's perspective, they're just strings. So strings are character vectors in R and Python, but they come in a lot of shapes and sizes. And depending on what you're doing, you may have like a list of strings or a dictionary of strings, or in R, you may have a data frame of strings, but either way, it's still just characters. So we'll learn how to work with characters in a few different ways. Okay, so I'm gonna use R and reticulate to run my Miniconda environment on Python using RStudio. And all of these slides are available on my GitHub online and through the course. Um, and all of this is written in Markdown. Okay. So let's think about some basic operations. Now, one bad thing about writing both R and Python in Markdown is that it is easy to see when you are using the Markdown file, which type of language you're using, because it is in the header of the chunk. It'll say R or Python or Bash. It's a couple of different things you can do. But once you print those out, mm, it stops being easy to see. So the top of each chunk, I have written what language that chunk is written in. And that just helps cue you watching these notes that that is the language that I'm talking about. Because if you open these in Markdown, you can see which language it is. But once it prints on the screen, the header of the block goes away. So this um, comment stuff is not necessary, is just more of a signal to help um, as you're watching. All right, so some basic operations here. How do we combine strings? So how do we put two strings together? Well, in R, one thing we might do is define two strings. So I called string one Swiss, string two cheese. And I could concatenate them together or combine with the C function. That produces me a vector of uh, strings in R. Okay, now, a vector is essentially like a small um, combination of objects or one row of objects. However, that didn't actually combine the strings together. So if I instead want to combine the strings together, I could use the paste function. Collapse, um, not paste, uh, paste zero is also an option in R. Okay. And depending on the type of thing you put into paste, you may instead use separate, instead use um, collapse. But collapse often is used on lists. Okay. So either way, there's a couple of options here within paste, but the function is generally paste. You put in the thing you want to paste together, string one, string two. Tell it how you want to separate those strings. I want to put a space between them. And now I have one object instead of two, one, two. I have one object that is Swiss cheese combined. Now over here in Python, this is actually easier. <laughs> so I, I kind of like this in Python. You can use the uh, math symbols on strings and it doesn't always do what you expect, but let's say we have a string one and string two. Now notice I redefined these because they're in my Python environment, not my R environment. Okay, so I, got, I have them in both environments now. You can make them talk to each other, but right now we're just using them separately. 
and I'm adding together. So string one plus string two, and actually did something sensible and added them together, slapped both of them together. Well, I need the space. So I could add a space in there. However, there's an easier function, join, that allows you to do this across many objects at once, like paste. And it's a little unusual if you're used to R, how this works. What you do is you put what separator you want. I want a space as my separator. You could do a comma here. You could do anything complicated that you'd like. And then you apply a function to that separator. So one of the big things you'll want to get as we work from R and Python is that R tends to have a function with some arguments. Python tends to say, here's an object, apply a function to it. Maybe some more arguments. Okay. So it's kind of a, di a different way of thinking. However, they're both computing languages. So we'll talk about their, their similarities. But um, I would say one of the biggest ones, other than the thing we'll get to in a minute, is the way that you have to tell it you want to do something. So in R, it's generally function arguments. In Python, it's generally variable apply this function, dot apply this function. Okay. So the variable here is a space, apply join to it. And what do I want to join? I want to join string one and string two. Okay. Now notice here that I have string one and string two in little brackets. Okay. Those little brackets indicate there's a list. A list in Python operates very similarly to a vector in R, which is a little confusing because there are lists in R. And I actually argue that a list in Python is actually a list in R, but I don't want to get too confusing in the beginning. So let's think about a list right now um, as a collection of objects. I told you a vector was a collection of objects. Okay. Now, if they're individual objects, those two things are the same. But in Python, I can make a list of lists, and that's where it turns into R's version of list. Okay. So R makes a distinction between a list of single objects and a list of complex objects. Python does not. They're all just lists. Okay. So if it's a list of single objects, like a, a row of numbers, that's a vector in R and a list in Python. If it's a list of data frames or a list of text values, that turns into a list in both R and Python. All right, so let's get into the other thing that's their very big difference between R and Python, right? And that is indexing. Indexing is how we call a particular row, column, spot, where you grab that thing. So I want the thing right here in spot number three. How do I get that thing? Okay. So in R, if it's a if it's an object that has multiples, um, string one does not, but it has one object in it. You put square brackets, one. Okay. If it's a data frame, you, know, you might have to tell it what row and column, but either way, use the square brackets and you indicate where the object is that you want. One, two, three, four. Okay. If you have a whole set of strings, then I can start to grab the second object. Okay. So Swiss cheese is great. I want number two. This seems entirely logical. One, two, and I get number two. If you use a negative symbol, it drops the object. Okay, so if I say negative two, okay, um, it drops the cheese. So everything but two, basically. All right, cool. Now let's look at Python. This is one of the first things that you'll notice. You pick the one here and it gave me a W. Now that first word is Swiss. Okay. So there's two things going on here. The first one is that it interpolates your square brackets as pull this apart by character. Okay. And R it pulls it apart by object. Okay. So when I had a set of strings, right? It, it, um, I'm sorry, when I had a single string, it says, well, this is just one object. And if you want a character, use a different function. And that function is substring. But I'm gonna treat this whole thing as the one object. Okay. In Python, when you have sort of one object there, Swiss, it says, well, if you're telling me that you want a specific slot, you must mean to break it down by character. Okay. And so the, the interpretation when there's only one object that you're looking at, Swiss here, I mean that by one object, it's Swiss, um, is to break it down by, by character. And that's very handy later when you have big strings and you want to cut off the top and the bottom, for instance. 
Now, when I put in the one here, I got the W, which most of us think of as the second letter in Swiss. However, Python is a zero index language, and this is a big star. This is the thing that if you've never worked with Python and have only ever learned R, you're going to find confusing. If you've done things in C++ or Perl or any of the other languages that are traditional, computer, more computer science-y, um, zero indexing won't be a surprise. But for folks who have only ever done R, zero indexing is a surprise. Okay. And so zero indexing means that the first spot is the zeroth spot. And the way I've heard to understand this is to think about elevators. And this must be a very European thing as well, but, um, or stairs. And so when you start, you're on the base, right? And so everything from the base is zero and everything above that is up, right, or down. So when you go um, from zero, starting on my, Z, my not step, right, and I go up, it's the first step the second step, the third step, or the first floor, the second floor. So I, I've actually found in Europe, they call the main level the zeroth floor. <laughs> and I was like, ah, Python makes more sense now. Um, in America, you know, it's the like lobby. <laughs> so it doesn't work so much, but um, uh, the, the main level is zero. So the first spot is zero. The spot above that is one and then two and three. So you always have to remember that the, the, the zero means the very first thing, one means the second, the first one after that, second one after that, et cetera. So when I ask for the zeroth object, I get the S because it's the first letter in Swiss. So big difference there. If you do the zeroth thing in R, it just goes because it's not a zero indexing language. Now, if I put in a negative, this also is, is different from R. What it does in R is it drops it. It interprets your question as drop this. And Python interprets your question as from the back. So uh, string two here, remember is cheese. And so what it does is it interprets this as the negative width object. So go to the end and pick the last one. Okay. You can't do negative zero. So, you would think, but no. So it goes to the end and takes the last one and gives it to you. That's also very handy when you don't know how long something is. Okay, so if you want to say the last three characters, you could do, um, you could do the last three characters. I'm about to get to something else <laughs> that I don't want to confuse folks on, but you could do like negative one and up. Now let's compare that with a single object, Swiss to multiple objects. So Swiss cheese is great. Now this acts like interpreting kind of like R does. Okay, when I say set of string zero, I get Swiss. Okay, I don't get just the S because there's multiple objects to interpret. So the only time that it does this character splicing is when there's one object. R never does this. And if I set a set of strings negative one, I get the last one. All right, so the big key takeaways here um, when you ask, if Python is a zero indexing language, so when you ask for zero, you get the first object. Uh, Python does the negatives as go from the back forward. And um, Python does character splicing on single objects. And if you have multiple objects, now it works the same as R. So some big key differences. And I, I'd recommend right, at least writing down the zero indexing one if you've never, the first time you've seen Python. Now, let me talk about one other thing that I was like about to get to a second ago, but I'm like, wait, hold till this slide. And that's slicing. Okay. Slicing is when you take a set of indices. So I want everything from here to here and I'm gonna slice it out and give it to you. Okay. So slicing, sometimes people call it subsetting. Um, this is very specifically called splice slicing in Python. So I'm trying to stick with the terminology. Um, but we do this all, you know, you do this all the time. I want only these two columns or I want only these four rows. And we'll use this a lot to um, get a specific section of text as well. Now, pretty much both languages use the colon operator to do counting between. So in R, if you do one colon four, you get one, two, three, four. And so here on my set of strings, remember set of strings is Swiss cheese is great. I asked for one colon two, so it gave me one through two, so Swiss cheese. Now I have to put something at the front and the back of that colon in R. 
So this is commented out, otherwise my slides won't rotten, but that's not allowed. You can't leave the first spot blank or the second spot blank. Now in Python, just reminders, here's my set of strings. You, if I wanted um, the first two objects, you, I just told you it's a zero indexing language. So you go, okay, so if you want the first two objects, you do zero through one. That makes sense, you would be wrong. And so this is the other big thing you need to write down that's different is that the colon operator is interpreted as first one up to, but not including the last one. Okay. So if you did zero through 100, you would get zero up to, but not including 100. Okay, so you get 100 objects because zero has got to count, but it's up to, but not including the last object. So I did zero colon one, I would get zero up to, but not including one. So that's basically zero. So you're only going to get Swiss back. And it's kind of cheating, but the way I tend to think about this is that the last number is how many I'm going to get. <laughs> but you have to remember up to, but not including that last one. If you're counting from the front anyway. Now, what's kind of fun is you can actually leave the first one blank. And if you leave it blank, it's interpreted as zero. I don't really recommend you doing this. I, I recommend you being explicit about your zeros, although you don't have to, um, in, in the first slot, because um, I just think it can get confusing and it will force you to think about the fact that this is a zero indexing language. Now, what's really handy is the other way. So if you don't know how many objects something has, but you know you want the last five, for example, uh, or not the last five, sorry. If you don't know how many you have and you want everything from here to the end, what you can do is um, say, give me two up to whatever's the end. So when you do two colon or anything colon and leave the second one blank, it will give you all the way to the end of the string. Okay. And that's useful because you don't have to remember that you should do zero, one, two, three, right? So if I did zero through three, I would get zero up to, but not including three. So I'd have to do zero through four. And then it gets kind of, you're like, but there aren't four objects here. So it's really handy to just do like um, the number colon and leave it blank. I want everything to the end. And that's how you get the end. Now I was saying earlier was like, if you want like the last three objects, right? So you can do negative one, negative two, negative three. So you can do negative three colon negative one. I do believe it gives you the whole thing. Okay, so the negative ones act a little differently. All right. So those are the kind of big key differences. Now let's talk a little bit about manipulating text now that we have some fairly kind of simple view of working with strings. Okay. And so how can we manipulate this text? If our ultimate goal is to clean up text, what are some of the functions we might use? Now this um, lecture series is going to be package overload. There are many packages in R that we can use and they're all written by different people and they're so great. I wish somebody would put them together, but in Python, we'll use a, uh, also a good number of packages. So this is going to be like package city here. <laughs> um, but let's just talk about some simple, simple stuff first. So here we go. I'm pasting together my sentence. I took my set of strings. I'm, I'm using something we just learned how to do, set of strings, and I'm collapsing them. Okay. Now collapse is used when you have, it's not just a list, it's a vector. <laughs> but you have a list of these strings um, or vector of these strings and you want to basically combine them in. So collapse that vector together. Okay, separate is when you have like two separate little strings you want to put together. I always get it wrong until I print it out and go, well, wrong one. <laughs> so it's either collapse or separate here. And you can use anything, comma, semicolon, whatever, but spaces make sense to me as an English speaker. Now I could use to upper, this is in base R to make everything uppercase. To lower, which is my favorite one, making everything lowercase. That's really useful when you're working with strings to normalize the text, to ignore basically proper names and the starts of sentences. We'll use string R as a package quite a bit. And in string R, there's functions for this. String R and string I, both great packages, both handling text manipulation. String to upper, string to lower. 
Now, the only reason I present this is because it has two other great functions, string to title, which is um, like title case. It capitalizes the first letter of every word. If the, um, the language that you're using is a capitals kinds of language, um, things like Chinese and Korean that don't have capitals, I believe, this wouldn't do anything. Um, string to sentence puts it into sentence case. So it capitalizes the first letter of the, of the sentence. And it will do that across large blocks of text. I just have you showing you one small piece. Cool, that's a nice way to format things. Let's look at that in Python. So here's another way to do this join thing. You could say that the joiner, um, you can make it a separate variable if you'd like. So I could say separate.join, put together my strings. Okay. That has the same functionality as putting the quote in where the word Seth is here. Um, whichever one you like. If you're gonna do a lot of joining, I recommend putting it as a variable at the top or something so you're not pasting it over and over again, but it's literally the same number of characters to type. So whatever makes you happy. Now, remember the difference, R likes function arguments. Python likes variable, apply this function. So sentence, which is our Swiss cheese is great, dot upper, sentence dot lower, right? Sentence dot capitalize is sentence case where you get the first uh, word of each sentence capitalized. Sentence dot title is title case. Okay. And those are all base Python functions, which means I don't have to load any extra packages to get that. Neat. Now, let's get into the tough stuff. As a human who has been writing code for a very long time now, um, regular expressions are a thing. They're, they're difficult. Uh, I, I'm always amazed when people write a regular expression without thinking because I have done them for a long time and I always have to Google it. So my first answer is always look at Stack Overflow and just try it until you get the regular expression right because there are different flavors of regular expressions as well, depending on what language you're using. So R, sometimes you have to do some extra stuff depending on which package you're using or which base R. Um, I used to write them a bunch in Perl, also a different flavor. So regular expressions are confusing. They are something that take a good amount of time to get kind of figure out. And so it's okay if you look at this and you're like, whoa, what is happening? <laughs> because there are many times where I'm like, how do I exclude this thing? And I'll just Google it. So regular expressions are not something I expect anyone to memorize because I clearly it doesn't stick in my brain either. And some of the um, R packages are actually meant to make this more human readable, but I don't know how successful they've been. Right. Depends on who you talk to, probably. So what is a regular expression now that I've warned you that they can be tricky? It's a flexible string pattern that allows us to look for specific text combinations. So you can see how this might be very useful for us because it allows us to look flexibly for things. And when I mean flexible, I, I don't mean just like, find the word cheese, I mean like find everything that ends in E and starts in C. Okay, so we can be very flexible. So I could say, let's, let's find all the Y words or let's find all the adverbs and let's just pretend for a minute that every English word is, does what it's supposed to do and they all end in L-Y. Ha uh ha, -huh. okay. So English is, is a tricky language when it comes to um, modifiers, um, suffixes and prefixes. Okay, affixes is the word I'm looking for. They don't always follow the rules, right? So it's so flexible, it can be quite hard to learn. <laughs> and that requires some trial and error. I'm remembering which language we're writing in. But, so we're gonna use the string R package in tidyverse in R and the re package in Python, okay? Now, the nice thing about string R and tidyverse is they've spent a lot of time trying to think through like how to make this easier. And so they have those some really great cheat sheets that you can use and look at to help you understand this. Okay. There are also some great R functions as well, grep and gsub. Um, I use both of those on a daily basis. And so um, one thing to know is that the string R package is often using grep in the background. It's just transforming their version of it into base R's version of it. So both of these are valid choices. All right, so let's, let's talk about some of the basic rules. A dot character matches any single character. So if you don't know what you want, just put a dot and that's any potential character, space, seven, H, P. 
a caret says a caret plus something else says match at the beginning of a string. So if I did caret b, that would find me everything that started with a b at the beginning of my string. A dollar sign matches the end of the string. So e dollar sign would match everything that ends in e. A star, and these are these are the confusing three, matches zero or more cases of the previous character. So if I did b star, that would match no b's or an infinite number of b's. Question mark matches zero or one of the previous character. So b question mark would be no b or one b. And a plus is one or more cases. So b plus would be one or infinite b's. So you'd use the first one, the star. If you aren't quite sure if it's there at all, it might be repeated 75 times. You use the second one if you want to see if it's there, um, not there or there. It's kind of a uh, zero or one instances. And plus is it needs to be there or it could be 75 times. I would say I mostly use either star or plus because most of my use cases fall under there at all or a million times or there at least once or a million times. But every once in a while that question mark's really useful where it's zero or one times. The pipe, which is above the shift key on the English keyboard, QWERTY keyboard, is the OR operator, this or that. The um, square brackets says anything found in these brackets, so match anything. Um, so if you had like one, two, three, it would match one, two, or three. So you would get kind of a true response or you'd find it if it had one, two, or three. The um, caret option at the beginning matches a character not present in the brackets. Okay. And so it's not at the beginning. I just told you that the character operator matched things at the beginning. When it's in brackets, it has a special situation where it says kind of the opposite of this. So if you had um, ABC in the brackets, it would find anything that wasn't ABC. Slash D matches any decimal digits. You could also use square brackets zero through nine. Uppercase D matches any non-digits or anything not zero through nine. Ace, ace slash S is any white space character. Slash S uppercase is any non-white space character. Slash W is any alphanumeric character where I can also use, this would get you nearly everything. If you were looking, if you looked for this, it would return nearly all text possible. So this is A through Z in lowercase, A through Z in uppercase, zero through nine and um, special characters. Okay, so that's a special instance. And then capital W matches anything that is not those. So the opposite. Okay. So in general, the lowercase version matches um, the thing that's there and the uppercase version matches the sort of not thing, except for digits. So let's put some of those into practice. So I'm gonna have this sentence. We can talk about numbers like how great is five because it's the best number there or what is this question mark doing here? Right. So in string R, <clears throat> what we've got is the string extract function. String extract extracts parts of the string that you're looking for. So we're gonna start with something dumb. Okay? So string extract from my sentence, give me a five back. Okay, so if it finds the five, it will return you a five. Even if there's more than one, it'll say, oh, I found one, here it is. Okay. That's useful in the sense of like true false verifying. Now there are other ways to do that, but essentially if it returns something that pattern's found, but it's returning exactly what you asked for. Instead, we'd be more likely to use string extract to look for any digit. Okay, so remember slash D is any digit. Now it's double slash because R is dumb sometimes. <laughs> so it's double slash and R. Like I said, they all have different flavors, but the sauce is basically the same. Okay. It depends on what kind of salt you want on it. Um, and so it finds the five. So this is useful if you're like, is there, are there any numbers in this sentence? Yeah, there's a five. 
The issue is that if there's more than one five, you won't know. And it'll just tell you that there's a five. So instead you could use string extract all, and it will find you all the instances of whatever you're looking for. So remember the question mark is a special character. It's at some um, zero or one of these things. But here I want a literal question mark. And so I've used the double escape to indicate, give me literally the question mark. So since all these symbols are characters on the keyboard, you can actually tell it, give me literally this. And so I'd do slash slash question mark. And that returned this in list format, unfortunately in R, because if you run for, you know, 700 strings, it'll return you one little list for each one. Um, and it says there's two question marks. So this could be good for counting. How many times does this thing appear in all these texts? Now, if you just wanna know if something is there or not, you can do string detect. So it said string detect, if there's an N in the sentence, and there is. To me, my favorite function out of all the ones that are available in string R is string replace all. It's just great because what it does is it says, okay, fine, in my sentence, find this pattern and replace it with um, this thing, okay? Now the exclamation point is not a special character, so I didn't have to escape it. And so it found every instance of the question mark and replaced it with an exclamation point. So this is very similar to um, find a replacement word. Now that's string R. Let's look at Python. So in Python, we've got to import our library. Okay, import, very similar to library in R. So pull in the library here. And we're gonna import re, re for regular expressions. First thing, um, we can talk about numbers, like how great is five or what is the question mark doing here? It's the same sentence. Okay, we're pulling it into Python. All right. And so the function here is re.search. Okay, re because it's in the repackage.search because it's the search function. Okay. And another big thing to get um, <clears throat> now that we've talked about some of the big differences between R and Python, the, the more subtle thing to me that I noticed is that when you use arguments, they tend to be in the opposite order. So like almost consistently, it's like someone knows. So in R it's, object to search, pattern to search. I said grep, grep may be the other way around actually. Anyway, um, object to search, pattern to search. In Python, it's what are you looking for and where are you looking for it? Okay, so, and I will always type them backwards and it will go lean like this. So just flip it. So it's the pattern to search for and then the thing that I am looking in. So find me any instance, sorry, first one here, find me the number four in my sentence. It very helpfully returns none. Okay. So there's no fours in my sentence. All right, fine. Find me the uh, D in my sentence, any digit here. Unfortunately, I do wish this were less dumb. So the object that it returns back, I find kind of obtuse, but it tells me, oops, apologies. It tells me um, where that object is, okay? So it is in slicing. If I were to slice and find just the, the digit, it's in 44 up to, but not including 45, because this is slicing in Python, remember? So you would do sentence square brackets, 44 colon 45. And that's how you get the digit that actually is there. Hey, so, okay, I can find the objects. What about, um, what about multiple objects? Well, re.search actually only returns the first one. So there are two question marks in this sentence, but it will only tell you about the span of the first one because it finds it and it's like, I'm done, thanks, bye. Re.findAll weirdly returns the actual object. So re.search returns where the object is, but re.findAll returns the object because re.find by itself returns the first object. Okay. Re.find all returns all of them. Research is where is it? Refind is what is it? Okay. Now there's this re.find iterable version. Now the, the nice thing about that is it allows you to loop over all of them that are available. 
<clears throat> so iterator objects are a unique type of thing in Python. Won't get into those too much right now, um, but there is this find dot or refined iter iterable object version. But like I said, our string replace all, what's the corresponding object in Python? It's resub for substitute. Okay. Hence also G sub global substitution in R. So find this, replace it with that in my sentence. So find the question mark, replace it with an exclamation point in the sentence. And it will actually print out. And the replace alls are very handy when it comes to things where I'm ref uh, controlling for contractions. Let's say I want to get rid of all the contractions in my sentence, which we'll do later. Um, if I have a list of contractions, then you just say, find these, replace them with these, and be done. So we'll use re uh, replace all and resub quite a bit. So let's get a, a head over what I need to do to clean up data. And we're kind of talking about this in an order that introduces concepts a little slowly. This isn't necessarily the order I would do this in. So we'll talk about that too. And in class, we do an assignment where we talk about the order. Um, but there, there are certain things to think about when working with text. So the first thing is that not all text is created equal. Things are messy. So unless you're wanting to study JavaScript and HTML code, you need to take that stuff out. So if you're scraping web pages, you will often get a bunch of crap like Java um, from their, um, or JavaScript rather, from their ads. So you got to find a package or a function that takes out all the HTML. Cool. We'll look at two of those. We could also tokenize it. So tokenizing is where we break things down into their individual pieces. So you might want sentences, you might want words, you might want characters, depends on the task. We could remove unnecessary tokens and or stop words. So stop words are words like the and a of into between the function words in a sentence that hold the sentence together. I often call them the glue of the sentence, but are not the meaning making words of the sentence. And generally analyses in NLP are focused on the meaning making words in a sentence. Contractions, contractions represent kind of an interesting set of tokens, it's actually multiple tokens in one, so you might decide to expand them into their regular forms. Spelling, which will always be a problem, and we'll talk about the limitations of spell check analyses in using code. And all the things that you could do with the finalized text. So you might be interested in stemming or limitization. We'll do a big focus on those two, so I'll explain them a little more later. Tagging, like part of speech tagging, adding noun, verb, adverb, adjective to it. Chunking, which is breaking apart certain parts of the sentence, like I just want a phrase or I just want um, uh, like the direct object. Parsing, which is where we break down the entire sentence into little trees. Okay, So there's a lot of uh, things I could do for cleaning up text, depending on my final goal. But remember, garbage in, garbage out. So if your text is not clean, who the heck knows what results it's going to give you? And I actually have an example later where I don't do some cleaning to show you that like it really does matter. So some basic terminology. Okay. I always imagine this because I teach basic statistics, right? Eat, sleep, statistics. Um, I always think about this as data screening because data screening is so critically important in any statistical analysis, because if you don't understand your data, you have no idea what those results mean. Or if you haven't looked at a picture or a graph or made a table, you don't know what the data is. And the same here, like if you haven't looked at the raw text and kind of checked to see that everything's looking okay, you don't know what the data is. And so it might be hard to interpret the results. Okay. Sometimes this is called text pre-processing, pre-processing or normalization. Okay. Depends on who you're talking to. I use normalization in lots of different ways. When I'm talking to linguistics people, that means something different than if I'm talking to, to coding people. But for our purposes, we'll treat these all the same, meaning we're all kind of, kind of making the text more regular so that our statistical analyses can combine like forms into things. So run and running are the same word. We can put them together into one form. It helps us create a nice standardized format. And then it allows you to combine or compare tokens that are similar. And it's just generally um, allows us to make this kind of clean. So I think this is where I want to stop, but I've lost the slide count. Okay, I think 
two more slides. Actually, let's, yeah. Okay, so let's do two or three more slides here and then we will um, call this one long enough. All right, <clears throat> so first thing we're gonna do is remove noise. So for this example, because um, this keeps going, I'm just gonna break the video into parts. Uh, what I'm gonna do is pull a blog post that I wrote about using Selenium and Arvest and used Arvest to talk about Arvest, which is a little meta today, but um, we're gonna do a small amount of text scraping, web scraping, and use that to show you how to remove noise. Okay, so we're gonna do some simple web scraping and clean up that code. And then um, throughout the next set of videos, we're gonna keep using the same example and the same data set. And that blog is still there if you wanna use this code um, to walk through how to do other components. Okay. So let me tell you a little bit about Arvest. Arvest is ours, one of ours text scraping packages. Okay, it's meant to sound like harvest because we're harvesting the data. So what do you do in Arvest is you put in the URL you're interested in, or you might write a loop to do a bunch of URLs. You read in the HTML, and then you use this HTML text to extract just the text. But I will tell you that when you do that, the metadata in the back of the website is still there. Okay, metadata is all the like um, keyword search engine optimization, a small summary. So this is the stuff that is kind of plugged into some of the Google search engines. And so I've got to cut out the, that metadata. Okay, so we're going to pull it in, but we're going to also cut out the metadata. And I encourage you to, to follow along by running these one line at a time and looking at what is back there. Okay, so I'm not gonna print the clean text each time because it makes the slides very long, but when you're working with it by yourself, you can look at the clean text. So I know that this blog starts with in this guide because I wrote it. Okay, so I'm gonna look for string locate all, all the times that I wrote in this guide. Okay. All right, cool. And I say, okay, I find here that these are the, the instances where it starts within this guide and ends within the guide. So this is the N, I, I'm sorry, and this is the E. And I want the second one. I know this because I've looked at it. And the second one here is where the actual text starts. This first one is where all the metadata is. And so like I said, this could be really helpful if we kind of pulled it up and looked at it. So let's just try that. I have no idea what R Studio is about to open. Could be anything. Oh, okay. An old analysis. So let's just real quick try running these. So when you run this, the blog post thing is a list. Okay. I don't need that. So I want my clean text, which pulls it out into a, a text piece. Okay, so let's look at clean text here. Now clean text, all these little slash ins, that just means it's an enter key. They're no big deal, okay? It has a bunch of this um, metadata at the top, all right? So I know that all this is metadata because I've looked at it before, right? So instead, what I wanna do is grab the first piece of my um, actual text here. And then at the end, I don't have too much at the bottom, but there's a little bit of extra stuff of some JavaScript. So here's some JavaScript down at the bottom. And so I wanna end by finding the word enjoy here because I know that's the last part of my text. So that's how I knew what to do here. It's because I like printed it out and I looked at it. So we're gonna say, okay, start at 4,081. Okay. And obviously um, when I ran this a different day, <laughs> it was a different number because these things do update. So that's one issue to see is that um, not always reproducible based on whatever ad is on the page. And so the JavaScript might be changing in the background. This is me updating Hugo. And so Hugo is how I built my blog and it does update whatever it's doing in the background. So um, that's when the numbers don't match from the first time I ran this and now, but I left it there to show you that point. Now we'd find the last instance of the string. So it should be eight, four, uh, eight, four, 10. And this is a very close number. Okay, so these were the numbers of the first time I ran it. 
So substring here is slicing an R. So I want to take clean text, start here and end here. And it did a pretty good job. It actually cut out 90% of the, the, the junk. And now we can start doing stuff with that, which will be in the next video. But let's look at how we do that in Python. Now in Python, we're gonna use the requests library. And we're gonna do the basic same thing, blog post. Okay. And request.get and get this website. And then our content here is blog post.content. Now here's all that metadata. So I use slicing here. I've got um, the thousandth or the 999th character up to, but not including the 2000th character, right? So I just printed out a section of it and I'm like, oh gosh, look at all this. So this stuff here is the metadata in the background. All right, well, man, I don't wanna use the metadata so much. So we're gonna use the beautiful soup package to clean it up. Beautiful soup is a great package. Now, here's another thing that's sort of an unusual Python thing. Okay, it's not unusual to Python people, but if you're an R, per I'm talking about this from an R person pers pers perspective. Um, you could load the entire library, import BS4, okay, for beautiful soup four. Or, you know, you could just say, yeah, I just need this one small part of that library. So load just this function. Okay. You could also do this in R, it's a bit trickier, but what, you, what a lot of Python people do is from package name, so from BS4, import only this function because that's the only one I'm gonna use. That does save space and memory. So from beautiful soup four or BS4, import the beautiful soup function. Okay. It cleans this up. So you say clean content equals beautiful soup it on our content. Okay. Our clean text is to say dot get text. So it is a couple more steps in Python, but I actually find it works much better than our best. Okay. Now it is much better at taking out the JavaScript and the HTML and, but not so much still on the metadata. Okay. Cause metadata is in um, often in XML or JSON format. And these handle JavaScript and HTML, which are two different languages. So we can use redox search, right, to find. And this is actually very similar. So that's how little beautiful soup has changed the text like between running instances, right? So we say redox search, grab the first instance, put it there. Redox search, grab the last instance and put it here. And I say, I say it worked pretty good. So here's all the text. I printed it out on this one. Now this log is about code. So that's why there's code in here. <laughs> and so now we have our text in both R and Python. And what we're gonna do in the next couple of videos is do stuff to that text. Now, in a lot of these, I'm gonna provide examples where I just print stuff out. But the general rule is if it prints out, it's not saving. And so you do want to save at each step. So this is one thing I found that students do, I don't do. It's like, I'm showing you, I'm printing it out so you can see what's happening. Otherwise it'd be a very boring lecture. But um, then they, they run that same code in the same way and forget to save it. So they're just printing out, you know, the spell checked version, the lowercase version, but they're not actually keeping that manipulation throughout. And so the general rule here is to save it, clean text equals, and then print a small bit of it so you can make sure it's doing what it's trying, what, what you want. Okay. I'm also gonna show you examples that I, I, I know have the thing we're looking for. So this blog post is fine, but it doesn't have any special characters. So I'm gonna show you how to use special, how to eliminate special characters and do a proof of concept. But remember, you need to manipulate your own text and not just the example from the, from the lecture. Okay. So I, I am, going to show you examples, be sure you're actually doing it on your own text if you're cutting and pasting. Okay. So come back for raw text part two, where we're going to look at, I don't remember, tokenization to get started.